Welcome to Exploring a Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Perry with the Circle of Atonement, and I'm here with Circle founder Robert Perry. And today we're talking about Jesus in A Course in Miracles. If you've been listening to us for a while now, you probably know that Jesus is one of our favorite topics. And so you may be wondering if there's anything that you haven't heard us say before, but never fear. One of Robert's favorite things to do is to find 10,000 new ways to cover topics that we think that we know. So you're in for a whole new angle on Jesus that we've never shared before. We're offering this podcast today as a preview of a new six-week course that we're hosting here at The Circle called Jesus in A Course in Miracles. That course has been seven years in the making, and it's designed to give you a solid foundation of who Jesus is in the course, what he came to teach us 2,000 years ago and now, and also what he's asking us to do both within our personal spiritual practice and for the world more broadly. And we'll get into some of that today. If you want to learn more about the Jesus in a Course in Miracles course, you can visit circleofa.org forward slash Jesus in ACIM. The course will run April 7th through May 15th, 2024, and we'll be sure to put that link to register in the show notes for this episode. The basis for the six-week course is that a couple of years ago, Robert pulled together all of the places in the course and in the additional material taken down by course scribe Helen Schuckman, where Jesus speaks in the first person. So Robert wrote little summaries of each of the passages and then organized them by topic. The result is a 173 page document and you'll receive that document as a bonus if you register for the Jesus in A Course in Miracles course. And I have to tell you, that document is just a thing of beauty. It's truly stunning stuff. And, and I know that pulling that together had a huge effect on you, Robert. So I don't know if you want to say more about that. I think it did have a huge effect on me. I think there were a lot of different parts of that. One of the main things is it really impressed on me what a major topic Jesus is in the Course. I think I had grown to think of Jesus in the Course as like, well, he's the purported author. But he's also a very large theme in the teaching, in the content of the Course, larger than you know, so many of the main themes. Like there's 80 pages that I collected in which he's speaking in the first person. And so I just got a sense of, oh my gosh, this, this teaching is voluminous. It is vast. I think there are scores and scores of categories I have in that document. And it also gave me a sense of the connection, like why the Course is Jesus, what it's doing in our world in relation to his appearance 2,000 years ago. Well, I know that document had a huge effect on you because, as I've said, this Jesus and A Course in Miracles course is seven years in the making because every year I'm like, let's do the Jesus course. And you're like, no, we've done Holy Week or this, that, and the other. We just done a bunch of podcasts on Jesus. And you did that document and you were like, we got to do this Jesus course. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And so really looking forward to that. But just to get started with our episode here. There's really no way to fully capture the impact that Jesus has had on our world. He is the most influential person to have ever lived. And 2,000 years after his death, roughly one third of the global population counts itself as his followers. That means a lot of different things, but the, the, figure is true. And as we know, Jesus is the purported author of the Course. Back in the 1960s, Course scribe Helen Schuckman, a Jewish-born, self-described militant atheist, began hearing an inner voice that spoke as if it was Jesus. This voice spoke of his miracles, his birth, his sayings in the Gospels, his disciples, his church, his mother, 
his crucifixion, his resurrection. And so the course itself is directly claiming to come from Jesus, but we as course students have had trouble with that from the very beginning. So why don't you pick up the story from there? If Jesus really is the author of A Course in Miracles, as we believe he is, obviously, that is a very big deal. It's a huge deal. And I don't feel that we as course students and as a course community have really taken that in. If you think about it, I mean, Jesus, in essence, snapped history in half 2,000 years ago. You know, our dates now, you know, start roughly at his birth. Um, he changed our civilization. And so if we now have what the Course purports to be, hundreds of pages of word-for-word -word teaching that's really from him, that has to have massive significance for our world and for ourselves personally. You have to wonder what kind of impact this document is going to have when it's all said and done. And yet it's really odd because as course students, we do want to keep the Jesus factor at arm's length. Uh, you've had your own experience with that for a while. It's only in the last few years that you've become more and more comfortable talking about him as, as forthcoming as we've been in the last few years. But this goes back to Helen and Bill. Both Helen and Bill shied away from Jesus as the author in their own ways. Helen referred to the author of the course as the voice, and Bill regarded it in his own words as a spiritual influence, quote, beyond conceptualization. And so that's the origin of the course. It's very founders shied away from Jesus, and we've all kind of inherited that legacy, right? We have, and I think it's understandable. I mean, so many of us have left the traditional church and feel scarred by Jesus. So you can understand why we wouldn't just completely embrace him here. My sense, there's no polling on this, of course, but my sense is that most core students accept that it's from Jesus. And yet I feel like they keep that at a kind of a safe distance and they keep the whole like connection with Jesus 2,000 years ago at a distance. You don't see a lot of curiosity among course students about the historical Jesus. We aren't all in there investigating, you know, the scholarship. Some people are, but not too many. Um, you don't hear course teachers focus a lot on the Jesus dimension. Um, I know a course teacher that that has said. I think many times it wouldn't matter if Mickey Mouse wrote the course. And I know, as you just said, I've shied away from it publicly. That dimension of the course has been central for me personally. But when you talk about it openly, you sound like a kook. And I'm somebody who I really prize my self-perception of being a rational person my roots in spirituality come from feeling I uncovered evidence for there being a spiritual reality. So I feel like as a spiritual seeker, my foundation is evidence. What evidence can you give for this? It just makes you look like a weirdo who doesn't care about rational thinking. Yeah, I remember saying to you in 2017, how do you explain that Jesus is the author of A Course in Miracles? And your response was, I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> and when yeah, you're it's a strange about, thing for all of when, us. Yeah. Well, I, I liked what you said in a podcast a while ago where it's like, I've got my reasons for believing that Jesus is the author of the course, but I know in casual conversation, I'm not going to have time to unpack those reasons and so it's better just to avoid the topic altogether. And I think that's a, true for so many of us. But you mentioned the historical Jesus and how as course students, we don't really get into his life. And I, I that's not unique to us as course students. I was a 
Christian until my late twenties and within Christianity, at least what I was exposed to the historical Jesus wasn't a big focus there either. And last summer you and I presented a workshop called the revolutionary message of the historical Jesus. And in that workshop, what we said was that we believe in order to understand Jesus in the course, you really do need to go back and take a look at Jesus of history, meaning the historical Jesus, and how he showed up, many scholars agree, is as a wisdom teacher. He was a teacher of unconventional, uncomfortable wisdom. And that to me is central. I've come to believe, and we'll play this out at length in our upcoming course, that understanding him as a teacher of unconventional wisdom is the key to understanding him 2,000 years ago and the key to understanding him in the course. I think it's the key to understanding him. And we tend to think just, you know, as, as people in a Christian culture, we think, well, he taught about himself. He talked about he's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the, you know, the the bread and the life and so on. Um, and we think he talked about like good morals. And that's wisdom, but that's conventional wisdom. And what I learned from studying the scholarship around Jesus, um, and I really learned this especially from Marcus Borg, the late great New Testament scholar. He said that Jesus taught a subversive wisdom. And subversive, of course, means to kind of undermine the established order. And what Borg said was that Jesus took aim at the four central concerns of conventional wisdom in Jesus' time, and those were family, wealth, honor, and religion. And in Borg's view, and I completely agree, the teachings are right there in the Gospels, in Borg's view, Jesus' teachings like radically undermined all of our conventional assumptions about those four categories. And he ended up urging us to do truly unconventional things like love our enemies, be as carefree as the lilies of the field, to sell all we have and give to the poor. So, so Borg's view, and I agree, was that he was a teacher of a radical, subversive, uncomfortable wisdom. And there's the problem, isn't it? He's just too radical. And the things that he's asking us to do on a personal level, loving your enemies, turning the other cheek, going the extra mile, giving your cloak, forgiving 70 times seven. I mean, that is just entirely too upending and entirely too uncomfortable for us. And then you also take his message and apply it to a societal level where he's basically saying, you know, through his table fellowship and whatnot, break down the social walls that are separating us from each other. And that's also entirely to upending. And so that's why Jesus inspired conflict basically from the moment he started his ministry to the moment he was killed just a few short years later. And that's what I'm, I'm realizing as we get ready for this course, what a through line that is. Okay, he has this radical message that people found very threatening back then, and we as course students find very threatening now, and we'll get to that later. But but my my thesis is that back then we found that radical message of love. We found that it ignited us, it catalyzed us, and at the same time it threatened us. And so what do you do with something where you feel catalyzed and you feel threatened? I think the compromise was to worship him. Make it all about him. He was God incarnate. He was the dying and rising Savior. And those tendencies started very, very early, as early as Paul, who was our earliest Christian writer. His writings come before the New Testament Gospels. Um, and so I think that even though, yes, they were so pro-Jesus, they called their religion Christianity eventually, um, it was all about Jesus. Isn't it interesting that when you make it all about him, 
He is the Son of God. He died for our sins. You suddenly move the importance of his teachings off to the periphery. I don't think that was entirely unintentional. I think it was unconscious, but I think we found that our comfort zone was in worshiping him as a subtle way to sideline those teachings, which were threatening. There's a poem that you and I love from Carl Heinz, and it's called A Dead Man's Dream. And the poem was inspired by the death of Malcolm X, but the heart of it really applies to Jesus as well. And I want to read this poem now because it is just too good. Again, this is Dead Man's Dream. This is by Carl Heinz. And as I read this, think about it in terms of all we've just said about what has been done to Jesus and his teachings. So it goes, now that he is safely dead, let us praise him. Build monuments to his glory. Sing hosannas to his name. Dead men make such convenient heroes, for they cannot rise to challenge the images that we might fashion from their lives. It's easier to build monuments than to build a better world. So now that he is safely dead, we, with ease consciences, will teach our children that he was a great man, knowing that the cause for which he lived is still a cause, and the dream for which he died is still a dream, a dead man's dream. Now, it is so powerful when you think about that applied to Jesus. By the way, I have to say that poem written for Malcolm X, I keep wanting to say it was written for Malcolm X and Martin Luther King because a dead man's dream and the way in which King's legacy has also been whitewashed is just too perfect. But it was written just before King died. But man, like three years what, before he died. What an amazing poem when you just, I mean, it's just on so many levels, we could do a whole podcast it, on that poem. It's it glorious. just speaks to human nature. So again, thinking about this in relation to Jesus, now that he's safely dead, you know, let us build churches to his name, let us glorify his name, sing hosannas to his name, but not actually be what he was about. And why is that? You know, again, it's just entirely too upending. It's too difficult. It's too threatening to our egos and too threatening to the powers that be. So, Robert, as you're saying, making Jesus the dying and rising savior means taking that focus off of his teaching and putting it on him as God's only begotten son. What happened is that meant that now there's two legacies of Jesus that have marched kind of side by side through the centuries, although one of those legacies won out. So the two legacies are the legacy, what you've called the legacy of love and the legacy of fear. So let's talk about these two legacies and how they've played out since Jesus died. Yeah, obviously this is a very non-conventional, non-traditional view of Jesus, but because I believe and we believe that he was this radical wisdom teacher, there is this legacy of love that, that represents who he really was. And even though we don't tend to think of him as a teacher, especially not a teacher of subversive wisdom, his teachings have changed our world, and that's a whole conversation we could have. Um, as you and I like to say, Bart Ehrman, the um, probably the leading New Testament scholar, at least in terms of you know public perception and influence today, he's working on a book, and he's the the thesis of the book is that Jesus's teachings quote focused on the selfless care of others to the extreme. These teachings got watered down by his followers; they were just so extreme. But even in their diluted form he is claiming that they ended up transforming the moral sense of Western civilization. So it's from Jesus, Ehrman is saying, that we inherited the sense of altruism, the idea that altruism should go beyond one's family and friends, beyond even one's people, and should encompass 
everyone. We got that from those teachings as watered down and marginalized as they were. They still changed our world. Yeah, because the idea of taking care of someone just for the sake of taking care of them, not because they're your blood, was new. It didn't exist before Jesus came along. And that's surprising to our ears, but he he is in the process of documenting that in great detail. He studied the Greco-Roman world, he studied the Jewish world, and he's basically saying that Jesus introduced a new concept that changed our world and that we all kind of take for granted today. Yeah, and it's a really interesting side story on Bart's book, if I've got this right. He originally wanted to write it on charity and how... Christianity and Jesus in particular influenced the concept of charity in the world. But then as he was doing all the research, he realized, no, actually, it's this concept of love. It's the loving your neighbor. And, and that's what fuels the charity. Like the charity doesn't fuel the love. The love fuels the charity. Mm -hmm. And that's Jesus's legacy. I, I can't wait to read that book when yeah. it comes out. Yeah. I, he's so let's talk about the legacy. Yeah. He's got yeah. a while to go. <laughs> He's got a while to go. Okay. So the you legacy talk about of fear. the legacy of fear? Yeah. Yeah. So from my standpoint, what we put on him when we decided to worship him as God incarnate has meant a legacy of fear. If you think about it, the idea in traditional Christianity is that, okay, so he is God come to earth to die for our sins, to satisfy the wrath of God the Father. And so without him dying for our sins, we would be exposed to eternal punishment. We would be, you know, doomed to eternal punishment. And then even once he did die for our sins, uh, we have to accept him as our savior, or again, we are doomed to burn in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. So he becomes this figure that represents divine judgment just as much as he represents divine mercy. Uh, and that figure hanging from the cross, you know, that we nailed him to, that our sins nailed him to, that figure who's going to return to judge everyone, is a source of fear. And so that's why I call that image we put on him when we decided to worship him a legacy of fear. It's so true that he has these two legacies he's a very mixed bag in our world we're really not we haven't quite figured out who he is and it's not hard to see the two different images of jesus absolutely everywhere i'm constantly talking about the flag that my neighbor in north carolina has in part because it's so garish right in front of his house with Jesus holding what looks like an AK-47 with a crown of thorns on his head and a U.S. flag waving in the background. I mean, this is obviously not the turn the other cheek Jesus. And at the same time, Jesus has always had this incredibly mixed legacy. You know, if you think about the Bible, like right there in the same book, the guy who said, love your enemies, can't be the guy who is going to bring God's damnation down on the village that smited him. It's just not the same person. And so along comes the course, and here its author is speaking as Jesus and using Christian language. And so if the course really is from Jesus, why do you think he came back now? I don't know about now, but one of the things that did really impact me in doing that collection of passages from a couple of years ago was there are some key passages where he is very aware of the outsized legacy he has had in our world. And the, the impression you get from all over the course is that he has returned in the pages of the course to do two things in relation to what we've been talking about. One is to advance the legacy of love, and the other is to correct the legacy of fear. So I want to talk about each one of those. Um, the legacy of love was about him being 
a teacher of unconventional wisdom 2,000 years ago. And boy, does he show up that way in the course. He is the wisdom teacher par excellence in the course. The course is just one long stream of subversive wisdom. And that wisdom sounds a great deal like his wisdom from 2,000 years ago, just fleshed out in very sophisticated psychology and metaphysics and philosophy, but the same radical heart and soul that he taught 2,000 years ago. So it looks like he's taking that legacy of love, the legacy of subversive wisdom, and advancing it. But he's also very consciously trying to correct the legacy of fear. And you just see that everywhere in the course. It's all over the place. Um, just a few examples. He makes it clear in the course that he's not God, that he was created as our equal, that he just made a different decision from what we have yet made. He makes it very clear he did not die for our sins and that there's no need to appease divine wrath because there is no divine wrath. He's emphatic about that. There's a great line in the course that says, I was not punished because you were bad. He's not a figure of judgment and condemnation in the course. He says the atonement was not established by the crucifixion, by death, but rather by the resurrection, by life. And that's a very short list that could get a lot longer. He's constantly trying to dispel the images of fear that we put on him, that we're not in keeping with the wisdom teacher he actually lived his life as. We're coming upon Easter this weekend, and you really see so much of what you've just described in his teachings around Holy Week, where he's like, this is a time of joy, and don't get detoured by the crucifixion, go right to the resurrection. And you just see how he's also trying to correct for those aspects of his legacy as well you know whenever he brings anything up anything he addresses relative to you know his legacy through christianity he includes subtle and not so subtle corrections yeah it's just constant well if he came to advance the legacy of love and correct for the legacy of fear let's talk about our role in that so you've been thinking about this in terms of four things that Jesus specifically wants us to do based on the statements that he makes in the course. And so I'm just going to introduce those and then we can comment on them one by one. So these are four things Jesus is asking from us in the course, starting with letting him free us from the legacy of fear meaning he's asking us to forgive him for the fearful images that we have put on him. And one of my favorite examples of this, this is something he does all throughout the course, but one of my favorite examples of this is in the clarification of terms, where he says some bitter idols have been made of him who would be only brother to the world. Forgive him your illusions and behold how dear a brother he would be to you. And that's so true. Uh, we really made some bitter idols of him. There's one on a flag right next to <laughs> where I live. So what do you want to say about us freeing him from that legacy of fear? The topic comes up, I mean, that gets communicated in so many ways in the course, but one of the ways which you just mentioned is he keeps asking us to forgive him. Okay, And it's clear that we're meant to forgive him for those fearful images we put on him. Um, and obviously, it makes it a lot easier to forgive him for all that if that was never him in the first place. If we falsely projected onto him, you know, he's the, the, the son of God who died for our sins and we don't believe in him, we go to hell forever and all that. And one of the things he's basically saying, and you see this quite overtly in some of these passages, is that as long as we hold those fearful images of him and kind of secretly resent him for all that, 
then that resentment of him basically blocks him out. He wants to help us, but we're shutting him out. So there's a great line that says, yet you would imprison me behind the obstacles you raise. So by holding these fearful images, we are basically raising up obstacles and saying, stay away. And that means he's limited in the ability to help us. That's so huge. And that's a whole other podcast on its own. I've met many course students who say some version of, I love what the course says, but I just don't want to have anything to do with Jesus. And then you and I believe that the course has so much to offer what we call post-Christians, those who are streaming out of the church right now in droves. And the course can offer them what they're looking for in church, but it can't do it if you leave embittered about Jesus. He just won't be able to kind of punch through. And that's so much of why he's asking us to forgive him or to, he's asking for us to remove the, the, the bitter idol that we have made of him. Yeah, and that means forgiving him, but forgiving him in a special sense. It's forgiving him for something he never did. It's for the illusions we put on him. Yeah. So the second thing that Jesus is asking from us in the course is to, no shocker here, follow his teaching, to let him be the wisdom teacher that he is. And this is the most obvious thing about Jesus in the course. He is trying to be a teacher in a very real and specific sense. And we saw this right from the beginning when it, with Helen at the beginning of the scribing process with the course, he's trying to get her to pay attention. He's trying to get her to reread the miracle principles and study for the study them as if there was going to be a quiz. It's easy to see how he really wants to be a teacher, and oftentimes we just won't let him. Well, that's my experience, and it's been a very, and it continues to be a surprising experience. We have all kinds of ways in which we basically protect ourselves from him as a teacher. And I think the reason is obvious. He is just as threatening now as he was back then. I, back then, we know from the Gospels, his ministry was full of conflict. He was threatening everybody. I mean, he was threatening to everyone until he got himself killed. And I think that continued, as we've been saying, in the form of his own followers saying, you know, those teachings are so threatening, let's just worship you instead. Um, and so for the very same reason we all found him threatening, you know, or everyone found him threatening way back when— we find the course threatening now because it's asking of, of us some of the very same extreme things, like loving everyone equally and the same. And you know, the course challenges our egos to the core, just as he did 2,000 years ago. And so, understandably, we resist. It's one of those things where, on the surface, it doesn't actually seem threatening at all. Like when you say well, everybody should love everybody and everyone should forgive everyone, it seems so innocent. But then you think about what it really means, because now we're loving our enemies. Now we're loving the people who attack us. Now we're forgiving oppressors. And it's too threatening. We just we can't let that in. We won't do it. Human psyches just don't go there. And on top of that, radical forgiveness and the course talks about loving everyone forgiving everyone i mean this is a radical thing to do it's based on radical equality so miracle principle 47 says that it's an understanding of perfect equality and holiness that is the foundation on which the miracle rests so again here's jesus saying love those who attack you everyone is perfectly equal. 
And again, this world, our human psyches, we're just not up to that message. We're, we just haven't evolved enough to really take that in. And so, of course, we resist. And that's one of the reasons why you and I love that quote so much about Jesus, where it's either he's insane or our hearts are too small to take in his message. You know, clearly. Yeah. Our hearts it's, are too small. It's the latter. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I just think it's so interesting that 2,000 years ago, he preached a message of unconditional love. That language wasn't around, but that was the message. He's preaching the same thing now, and he ignited such resistance back then, and he still does now. The resistance of Course in Miracles students is famous. You know, they're well known for throwing the book against the wall, throwing it in rivers, flushing it down the toilet a page at a time. Um, Throwing we even it in this, ditches. We even have this great story, <laughs> speaking of that, um, from somebody in our community who was driving along one day, um, flung her copy of the course out the window into a ditch in anger and frustration. And then sometime later, she's in a course group. So she's obviously back with the course. Um, another common thing that happens. Um, and they were all saying how they came to the course. And another woman in the group said something like, you won't believe this, but I came across it on the side of the road. And it turns out it was the road where she had thrown her book out. So yeah, that you woman can't had make this stuff book. up. Right, right. <laughs> so, the, you know, these stories are rampant. The course just, it, it, something in us just feels such fierce resistance. But I think more importantly than that is the sneaky resistance that basically is the same kind of resistance that I think early Christianity demonstrated. And the sneaky resistance is where we embrace the Course, we talk about it with enthusiasm, we read it incessantly, maybe we teach it, but we subtly put up a buffer between us and the actual teaching. And I think that is the norm with the course. Yeah, for sure. And the ways that we do that are practically endless. We say that the course is metaphor. That's a way of resisting what it really says. We say that studying is antithetical to spiritual awakening. There's, God, a million and one ways that we resist. What are some others that you can think of? Well, we could be at this for a while because I've been, you know, teaching the course for 40 years, basically, um, starting either this year or next year. And I've just seen so many permutations of this. So one, I think one way is we say every page says basically the same thing. And that means we're not really digging into those pages and seeing what they actually say. Or we say, well, it means what it means to each person. That means we don't care what the author meant. All that matters is what I think it means. Okay, we say it's just the one truth in Christian language, but it's not. And that means that we're essentially putting that one truth on it, um, thinking that underneath the language, it really means this, what we want it to mean. We say, I already understand it. And I honestly think no one is remotely close to already understand. I don't know. I don't care who you are. I think saying I already understand it is a way to kind of like not really try to understand it. Including um, you. You. Yeah. No, I don't feel remotely just, close to understanding it. No, it's just, it's just beyond us. Um, and that's part of the excitement of it because there's always more to learn. There's always more to see. There's always things to correct that you thought you knew, but you were wrong about. Um, I mean, you we understand a lot, obviously. I just didn't want to give the impression that you're saying, well, I understand it, but no. <laughs> so, Are you disrespecting my understanding? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I'll be the first to say that, that, you know, it's like there are mountain ranges past anything that I can see, and I'm exploring them all the time, but there's always more. Um, we say that trying to really honor the words and be true to the words is fundamentalist. I've heard that. I can't count how many times. And what I think all these ways add up to is he is trying to teach us in these words 
and we just don't really want to let him. Um, one of the biggest examples, in my view, is with the workbook, because I feel like not everybody, but collectively the course community has more or less, almost like by silent common consent, decided that all that practice the workbook asks us to do, we don't really need to do. It doesn't really mean it. Um, we've even said, we've even passed around this idea that the way to do it right is to do it wrong and forgive yourself. That's all really convenient, but the workbook never talks anything like that. It doesn't, doesn't talk that way. So what my experience is that we, while embracing the course and being enthusiastic students, we have major authority issues with Jesus acting as an actual teacher who has his own ideas, who has his own agendas, who has his own instructions, because we feel like the teaching is too threatening. He's trying to take our toys away, trying to take our ego away. And so I think we do with the Course exactly what Christianity did with the historical Jesus, find a way to say a big yes on the surface while saying a deeper no. I've had more than one student and a course teacher say to me that they are, have advanced beyond words. And so while still studying the course, while still a course student um, or still the course is still their path, they have advanced beyond words. And I'm just looking at this book and I'm like, do you know how many words are in this thing? <laughs> There's like 2000 pages here. That's a lot of words. And it does feel like a very convenient way to avoid doing the work that he's asking us to do and to really take in the teachings that he's asking us to take in. And well, this is nothing new. Um, do you want to say something? Yeah, just on that note. I mean, there used to be a course teacher who would take out these full page ads I saw in spiritual magazines and the ad said, don't study A Course in Miracles. And I think the idea of we're going beyond words, we're not going to study, it's all a way to say, you know, Jesus, through those words, you are trying to teach me something very specific. And guess what? I'm not up for it. Okay, yeah. I'm going to find a way to not let you teach me and make it like the spiritual high ground. So along that line, I'm reading a book now called Following the Call, and it's a decent book about all the ways in which the Sermon on the Mount has inspired authors and teachers through history. And it's, it's kind of an incredible idea. The Sermon on the Mount has been more influential than I think maybe you and I have even given it credit for. But in that book, it makes a similar point to what you and I are making, except regarding Christianity. And there's a quote from Walter Kaufman in there that says, quote, Christianity is the ever renewed effort to get around the sayings of Jesus without repudiating Jesus. <laughs> 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 I love that so much. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's, it's just human nature. It's, you know, it's not a crime, but this is what we do. And this is what we should pay attention to because the same thing is happening in the course community. We are it's in our own ever renewed effort to get around the teachings of Jesus in some ways while repudiating Jesus <laughs> or, or without repudiate either way. Yeah. I think it's the human response to Jesus. His teaching is so compelling, but it's so subversive. It's so radical, and it's hard. Um, my own history with the Course has been a very long one of trying to more and more face what he's actually saying. And one thing I, I've been realizing uh, in recent years is how much I would just mentally assume I read the course and I'd say, oh, important stuff, noise word, noise word, yada, yada, important stuff, noise word, noise word, yada, yada. I would mentally just assume a whole bunch of it was not important and, and was just kind of filler. And my own journey has been one of saying, okay, more and more and more, none of it's filler. He means all of it. All of it's important. And it makes a huge difference when you're willing to face all of it. And I'm, I'm still getting there. Yeah. Well, that's obviously a big deal for you and I. We could 
park on that for a little while longer, but let's yeah. move on to the third thing that Jesus is asking from us in the course. And that is to let him work with us personally, to let him be our personal teacher and actually be our guide. He wants to be involved in our inner journey and in our outer journey, the same way that he was with his disciples and the same way that he was with Helen and Bill. In the clarification of terms, he says that it's possible to find benefit from the course without accepting him into your life. And he also says that he can help you yet a little more if you share your pains and joys with him and leave them both to find the peace of God. So he, I love that he's very clear that he can, you, know, you don't have to let him into your life to benefit from the course. But if we accept him into our lives, he can, he can help us a little more. And so often in, you know, you'll hear from some students that, well, Jesus doesn't really exist. So first of all, we have the resistance, but then part of that resistance is saying that Jesus is a metaphor, that he doesn't really exist. And therefore we can't have a relationship with him because how could you have a relationship with a metaphor? So let's say more about he can help us a little more if we actually let him be our teacher and our guide. Or I think I've heard that we could have a relationship, but it's not a real relationship because he is kind of a metaphor. He's not of this world anymore. You know, there is no Jesus anymore, so to speak. Um, well, I think that's an example of what we're talking about, not letting him be the teacher he shows up as in the pages of the course, because in the, in the course, I've collected several places, a number of places where he basically says, I'm real. Like, let me be real. <laughs> um, there's a quote that says, let my relationship to you be real to you. Um, he says in another place, it's the ego that's trying to convince us he's not real. The ego wants to tell us it's real and he's not when the truth is the reverse. And there's, a, there's that passage that you and I both love from Lesson 69, where he's giving us meditation instruction for that day's uh, workbook lesson. And he says, if it helps you, think of me holding your hand and leading you. That sounds like the usual thing. And well, if it's helpful, you, know, you can think of me holding your hand and leading you. It's like, what a nice, what a nice thought. But then he says, and I assure you, this will be no idle fantasy. He's assuring us it's not just our imagination that he's holding our hand and leading us. He'll really be there. So basically, he's saying, let me be real. And that leads us into all the ways, and there's a lot of ways in the course, in which he wants to be involved in our journey with the course on the inside and involved with our lives on the outside. And this is a long list that we can't go into right now, but he wants to help us with our course study. He wants to join us in our practice periods in the workbook. He even wants to meditate with us and pray with us. He really wants to be involved on the inside. Um, and then he wants to be involved on the outside too. He wants to guide our decisions. He wants to speed us through the trivia of our lives like shopping he wants to take care of what he calls our lower order concerns. He will send us opportunities, he says, in which we can give a miracle to somebody else. He, he talks like he will guide us through it all while he's also orchestrating it all on the outside. So he really wants to be involved. And the question is, are we willing to let him be involved at that point? kind of intimate level with our lives because we know what he's like. He's not going to say, yeah, just let her rip with your ego. He's always going to call us to the highest. Yeah. Okay. The fourth thing that Jesus is asking from us in the course is to let him complete his ministry through us. And I love this one. He wants us to be one of his new teachers in the world. Throughout the course, he's calling us to continue his work as a teacher, to continue his work 
as a miracle worker. And he even says that he will work through us personally as we do this, which is an amazing idea. So you see this in the course in the very first line where he says, you will see miracles through your hands through me. And he continues that message through all three volumes and beyond. So let's talk about this yeah. idea of he wants us to continue his ministry. I love that idea. Um, that's obviously, you know, so much of what drives you and me. Uh, and I love the idea that his ministry didn't stop. Like when I was, I was a Christian, you know, as a youth um, for quite a few years. And the idea you get is he had this ministry, but it led up to the real thing. He died for our sins. And then after he died for our sins, he went up and sat at the right hand of God the Father. I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it gives you the impression that he's sitting up there next to the power. He is the power. And you don't get the impression of that ministry of going about and doing good, healing people, teaching people. You don't get the sense that's still going on. Like the ministry ended uh, on Good Friday. That's the feeling I always got. And in the course, it never ended. It just expanded. Once he was resurrected, he had the ability to be everywhere at once. And so he is, he's is—he's been conducting his ministry all over the world just invisibly ever since then. He wants to conduct it with us. He wants to teach us, to, to guide us, to heal us, just as he did with his disciples, like you mentioned a, a minute ago. Um, and he now, because he doesn't have a body, and he's invisible, and he has no physical voice. He wants to continue that ministry through us. And that's a beautiful idea. And you see quotes like this all over the course. So one of them says it very directly. It says, as God sent me to you, so will I send you to others, but I will go to them with you so we can teach them union and peace. So he's basically saying, I'm going to send you out, but when you go out, you're not going out alone. I'm going with you, and then together we will teach people. Together we will give miracles. My favorite quote along this line is, teach peace with me and stand with me on holy ground. You are forever making fun of me because I have put this quote on mugs, on t-shirts, on the swag bag for our 30th <laughs> anniversary event in Sedona. I love that idea that we can teach peace with him and stand with him on holy ground. If you really take that seriously, that quote alone can change your life. And Jesus, of course, no longer has a body, so he needs us to work through. And so we can become the vehicles in which he can continue his work in the world. And he says this throughout the course. He says in the workbook, literally, you are my voice, my eyes, my feet, my hands through which I save the world. And one thing I also love is that even though he honors the efforts of the disciples back in the day, He's clearly hoping that we are going to get it right this time. At one point, he says to Helen, they did not understand. And so now I come to you and give you the same message. Um, so it's a message that's big. It's scary. It's threatening to our ego. It's threatening to our uh, social system that is so hierarchical. Uh, you know, he came and could crash all of that down, but it's the same message and we're avoiding it in the same ways. It's true. I think what I came away from that a collecting of the quotes with was the sense that it's like, he's just getting started. And so he has so much work left to do and to do that work he needs to advance the legacy of love, the legacy of Jesus as a teacher of unconventional wisdom. But he also needs to correct that legacy of fear. And so if he can correct that legacy of fear in us, um, if we can forgive him, 
And then if we can let him be our teacher, if we can let him work with us personally, and if we can be his arms and legs and voice, then the work he needs to do in this world can go forward. What a beautiful idea. And just to recap all of those four points, the things that he's asking us to do in the world. First, he's asking us to let him free us from the legacy of fear. He's asking us to forgive him for the fearful images that we have put on him. He's asking us to follow his teaching, to let him be that wisdom teacher that he is. He's asking us to let him work with us personally, to let him be our personal teacher and our guide. And he's asking us to let him complete his ministry through us. And when you take all of those points together, it really is a beautiful picture and one to which we can dedicate our lives. I love that picture. And we need a new picture of him. Our world needs a new story of Jesus. Well, there is so much more that we can say about Jesus, both in his original ministry, how he shows up in the course, and more. We'll get into this and more in our upcoming six-week course entitled Jesus in A Course in Miracles. So we do hope that you will join us for that. As I mentioned earlier, this class has been seven years in the making, and what inspired us to finally make it happen is that document that Robert put together, 173 pages of passages of Jesus in the course, and that's a bonus that you'll receive free immediately when you register for Jesus in A Course in Miracles. It's a fascinating picture of Jesus's nature. And again, as we've covered here, a fascinating picture of what he's asking of us. If you want to learn more about our upcoming course, Jesus in A Course in Miracles, it runs April 7th through May 15th, 2024. You can register at circleofa.org forward slash Jesus in ACIM. As always with circle programming, no one is turned away for an inability to pay. So if you want to attend, but you're facing financial hardship, we'll be glad to help. And the scholarship details are on the page. Robert, is there anything that you want to say before we close? Well, I think I just want to echo things we've said throughout about the bigness of this. You know, if this really is Jesus, that's a huge deal. We, I think, will benefit from taking it, like not keeping it at arm's length, but really letting it in and, and letting him in. If, if Jesus is the author of A Course in Miracles, he has come back. <laughs> and that there, is there a bigger deal than that? So good stuff. Thank you, Robert for a great conversation as always thanks to everyone for watching or listening and we will see you next time bye for now